Coming up, we have a conversation with Justin Keenan, um, who is one of the writers on Disco Elysium, which is one of the most interesting games I've played in the last year or so. Hi, Justin. Hey, good um, to be here. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Well, I know it's a bit early over where you are, um, so appreciate you getting here on time and ready for um, a chat about your work on Disco Elysium and any of the other stuff that, that kind of comes up. So um, can I ask you first to, to kind of introduce yourself and your role at Zaum? Is that how you pronounce it, Zaum? Uh yeah, that's that's about as close as I can usually pronounce it. Zaum, Zaum. <laughs> there used to be a record company in the 80s called ZTT, which had a really weird Zang Tung Tang or something over here. It reminds me of that because it's got the, the slash in the middle of it. It's really mm -hmm. hard to say. But anyway. Mm -hmm. It makes um, it look very cool, though. That's the main thing. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. So, yeah, tell us about your role at, at Zaum, and uh, tell us if you mm -hmm. can about your your where you came into the Disco Elysium project as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm I'm one of the writers at the studio, and I uh, came on to Disco in um, late 2017, or early 2018, originally as an editor, um, and then kind of quickly. Uh, worked my way up onto the writing team, and that's really what I've been doing since then. Okay. Um, and w was the game kind of underway when you came into it, or were you part of the first wave of? Uh, no, I was not in the first wave. the um, The game was pretty well underway when I started, though. Um, there were still large parts of it that had not been written, and um, importantly, like very few parts of it that had been like edited at all um so there was uh i knew it was there was a lot of work to to be done but it was also clear that there was um something there and that it was like going someplace importantly great um so yeah i i mean i i really enjoyed playing it i found it to have a depth like uh, unlike a lot of other games that i've played even even of a similar kind of genre with with that kind of branching text uh and audio but it was deep it, it, for me it was one of the deepest games that i think i've ever seen um uh what what how do you think of it what, what's your kind of, if you have to describe it to somebody or it's it's unusual nature how do you describe mm -hmm. it to people uh i i always suck at this question and even though i've like had to answer it many many times um I and mean, we say it's a it's a role-playing game it's a, a computer role-playing game but um it's not a uh a kind of typical uh say like high fantasy adventure game you know you're not um you're not playing like a wizard or a fighter or a thief or whatever you're a um, a detective you're always a detective um you're always the same detective in fact and you're um trying to to solve a very strange murder in this very particular place and um at the same time uh you're also trying to uh remember discover decide like who you were um because at the start of the game you um wake up with no memory of yourself or the world that you're in because of a uh, an apocalyptic bender that you've gone on and uh, kind of untangling what happened to you and why you did those things to yourself is a uh, like kind of as much a mystery as the actual murder that you're sent to solve yeah um you're doing a really good job of not giving too much away which <laughs> which is great because it would we don't want to ruin the game for anybody who hasn't played it but um i mean have you got a favorite bit of the game um without any spoilers is there a favorite mm. favorite thing that happens or a favorite interaction that you really like? Uh, man, there are a lot. Uh, to me, the uh, the first time you meet um, a character named Kuno is like uh, that. To me, is like one of the the best parts of the game, and like one of my just speaking as a player now, like one of my favorite moments in uh, in any role playing game that I've played. So Kuno is this. Uh, adolescent that you meet um at the very start of the game he's one of the first three or four characters that you meet and he is um 
hanging out on your crime scene, uh, throwing rocks at the body that you need to take down from this tree. And so, uh, you know, most players will like see this kid and be like, ah, here's a child. He can like tell me some helpful information. And Kuno is just like completely foul mouthed, like profoundly, profoundly unhelpful child um, who uh, and just like the way he's written is just like completely beautiful. And, and the interaction is, um, uh, I think really helps set the tenor for what this game is going to be like and how it's going to be different than than you sort of expect. Um, and and like one of the reasons I, I love that character so much is because the more you um, uh, the more time you spend with him, the more that kind of initial uh, hyper aggressive facade kind of falls away, and you can like uh, you can discover that there's much more of a vulnerable damaged human under there that like maybe you even can identify with somewhat um and i i want to say i did not work on this character at all so i can like keep all the praise i want on him um but it yeah, takes a while uh, to get to the vulnerable part of kuno <laughs> well and, and some players never do and that's like part of the beauty of it like i've i've met people who played the game and just like oh yeah kuno that little shit like <laughs> he was such an asshole the whole time and then other people who for whom kuno is like the most important you know, non-player character of the game. Um, so yeah, Kuno is extraordinary. Um, my favorite thing that I have like worked on personally, I think, are uh, actually like the books and games that you can get from the the bookstore. So in most uh, computer role playing games, uh, the books or scrolls or videotapes or whatever that you can collect are just like places to dump random paragraphs of lore or background or world building and um they don't they don't capture what it is like to actually find and read a book or or anything like that and um an idea that's very important in disco is um what i sometimes call a uh, representation over simulation and it's the idea that like we're not trying to um duplicate like the material experience of doing anything in the world. So there's when you get a book, you're not seeing the text of the book itself, and there's no page that you click to turn or anything like that. Um, but what we do try to capture is like the subjective mental experience of what reading a book is like. And so um, you know, those, those books that you can get, you talk to the books as though they were a person. The book kind of talks back to you. And um, the way, uh, you know, it, Basically, I, I got this assignment um, as one of my first uh, kind of writing assignments working on the game, and uh, I was really dreading it. I, I did not want to be the person who had to write the like two paragraphs of lore to dump in the book that you know nobody wants to read. And so I said, like, well, how do I make this fun and interesting for myself to work on? Um, and and that's when I uh, started developing this idea of like, ah, well, you should have a kind of talking to a book should be like talking to another character and um, that should kind of be a relationship that you can develop and sometimes it's antagonistic if like the book isn't helpful or if you don't like the book that you're reading um, and uh, you know I, I, th I think that's like a, a place where we've found a way to take a kind of like tired uh, trope or tick from these sorts of games and like do something special with it yeah i mean it's it's full of kind of interior thinking drives kind mm. of decisions like the the relationships with the outside world of objects as well as people has this kind of like depth and and in in an interior you kind of, and that, and obviously the the kind of in the uk in the english version that the, the, the mm -hmm. voice is really important i know i was going to ask my friend who played it in french how how his kind of main narrator was because the main narrator voice is like significantly characteristic as well i guess um uh, yeah it's incredible uh, lenville did an amazing job with the, the narration did i read that he'd not really done that sort of work before or yeah, I think he's a um, a jazz musician by background. I think this was his first professional VO work, um, and uh, but no, he's he's just got the voice. Like you can't. It's impossible. I think after having played the game with uh, with Linville's voice in your brain to like imagine it ever being another way. Yeah, 
how many hours of audio is there in the game? Oh man, I don't know. There's um, 1.2 million words across um, the the final cut version of the game. Um, I have no idea what that comes out to in audio hours. I'm sorry. Don't worry. It's don't a worry. lot. Don't it's worry, many, yeah. many audio books. <laughs> um, so I know that we kind of, uh, we talked about kind of the theme of this talk being about the world building and stuff. I was just wondering what, what mm -hmm. you could say about that. I mean, what, what you, when we initially had a quick chat about what this was going to be, and you mentioned the influence of 19th century literature and paintings that was really interesting to me and i hadn't seen it mm. but when you mentioned it it seemed like really obvious mm. yeah i mean i think one of the things that sets disco apart from a lot of uh, other like not just role-playing games but other modern video games is that um like i think most games their aesthetic references tend to be other games and movies like most um especially like triple a games they kind of aspire to be like hollywood movies in in a lot of ways and in, in the way like the camera works and the way the the kind of like spectacular action sequences that they produce and that sort of thing and like there's nothing wrong with that there's lots of uh obviously like great movies great other great games to reference and things like that um but that's not the only way to think about like what games can aspire to and um you know it's how most of us uh, we are all video game developers now but most of us started out as um like writers or artists or musicians or, or something else and um i think one of the special things about the studio is that people bring this um uh we might call like more traditional fine art backgrounds to making video games and so uh for us on the writing team like a lot of our favorite books are are these like 19th century social novels um emile zola uh like german all especially is a a big one you can kind of see that in the um the strike situation going on at the harbor um i, I personally think there's a lot of dickens in the game the kind of uh colorful grotesque characters the kind of um exaggerated like social situations and and the kind of interest in like uh class and poverty and how like regular people live in this kind of almost like cartoonishly hostile world um and then like you know there's also a lot of uh harry could be a dostoevsky character if dostoevsky was funny yeah um and and so like that's all uh kicking around in there and like on the um the art side you know the the visual style of the game is very painterly and a lot of there are many like modern references to that as well but there's like 19th century oil paintings especially um Ilya Rapin the the Russian artist um is a big influence there and I, I think that one of the reasons the game works as a total work of art is um the fact that the uh the writing and the visual references like kind of go together nicely like the the kind of way that an oil painting like the faces are are recognizable but also smeared and a little grotesque or, or sometimes like a little uncanny at the same time um i think also like goes well with the way that the text works and like how that uh how we how we evoke those characters like through their voices and through the narration as well yeah i def definitely definitely when you when you put it in that context it, it it starts to leap out like that i think um in terms of limitations um which obviously in any creative field are are important and and really drive the creativity is there any specific examples of that 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 really are pertinent from disco elysium um yeah i mean i think the the main one is like on around harry himself like the subject of the the player character so um you know if you play most role-playing games the kind of one of the big selling points is that you can like be who or whatever you want to be you know if you um uh play a, a traditional like dungeons and dragons style role-playing game uh the first step of starting the game and like for people who um 
who grew up on these games like I did, this is a kind of like wonderful part of the game. You spend 45 minutes creating your character and like not playing the game in any like typical way. You know, you pick, okay, am I playing like an elf or a giant lizard man or a walking skeleton or boring human or whatever? And then I have to decide like, okay, what's the, the sex of this character? What is their profession? Then, you know, you distribute all their skill points and everything. And um, these games like support like a kind of extraordinary range of what kind of person you want to be. Um, but the, that also like comes with trade-offs because the, um, the text that they write for the scripts to go with that game have to like make sense no matter what kind of character the player has created at the start of this game. And um, just like <laughs> you are you are limited by the number of words that your writers can produce and like how and like the the sanity of your writing team and like how many variations and things they can like keep in mind at once. Um, and and like at the start of disco, all you do is select your um, kind of basic distribution of stats. Like um, Harry is never going to be um, a wizard. <laughs> he's always going to be a cop. His name is also always going to be Harry. And like, he's always going to be a man. Um, and like that is a, a a decision that we made um, because we were we were like less interested in exploring these questions of like um, you you sometimes call uh, these other style of RPGs like power fantasies you know you progress in various levels you start out with like one derpy spell or a tiny shitty sword or something and by the end you're like a demigod striding the earth like killing tons and tons of monsters and so on. Um, and so the kind of questions that those games can ask are like, are you good? Are you evil? Are you something in between? Or like, um, how powerful are you you're going to become? Or like, what will you do to save or destroy the world and so on? And um, th those stories can be great, but they're also not the only sort of stories that role-playing games can or should tell, I think. Um, and so when you take as a as a starting principle, um, Harry is like not going to save the world. He's probably not even going to change the world very much. The questions start to become very different. They become more like, well, what does it mean for Harry to be a cop? Like, how does he approach his job? Is he good at it? Is he bad at it? Um, and like kind of where it gets, and this is like a kind of classic a modern literature question, like where do you find meaning in the world? Like, especially when the world is um, as broken and fucked up as the world of the game is, or like as our own world is. Um, and so that's why these, the fact that you can spend a lot of time just reading books in the bookstore or trying to find a way to like paint the wall because you think you might be an artist secretly or, um, you know, even just running around and, and spending many hours getting to know uh, what's really going on behind Kuno, which like has nothing to do with the main story, um, but could be a, you know, maybe you as a player, like find meaning and like trying to get to the bottom of this like messed up kid who like maybe reminds you a little bit of yourself. Um, and those are, are things that um, you can only explore sufficiently if you don't also have to account for the possibility that like, uh, well, maybe Harry is like also a circus clown and like has to be able to go to the circus in the middle of the game and so on and so forth. Um, but it, it connects to that, what you've said a couple of times now about the um, the depth or the interiority of the, um, of the game. And it's sort of that, uh, that division between like in a, a kind of more expansive game with like way more maps and like a way longer playtime than we have like most of that writing is focused on supporting things you can do in the exterior world and in our case like the focus is like way more constrained the map is very small you're always one character and so that like writing and imagining goes inside harry's brain and um like how big can we make that interior world it's a labyrinth, isn't it? It's really like in the classic. Yeah. To me, there are a couple, I, of, I... There are a couple of Borges references buried in the game too. So <laughs> Borges and yeah. labyrinths are, are like very, yeah, that's like right in the, 
the DNA of what role playing games and branching narratives are. Yeah, brilliant. Um, okay, well, I'm, there's a couple of questions coming in via Q and A, so um, I'll, I, I might leap over to these, and then we can kind of come back to Disco uh, if that's okay. So. The first one is where is the line between telling a story and giving the player agency? I mean, that's like the game developer's job to find out. Um, and it, it's a, a negotiation. Like there are people who, um, who think disco is essentially just a visual novel and like barely counts as a game. Um, I think for me, the question is always, is this agency meaningful? And that, that agency can, and, and whether a thing is meaningful depends on the context of the game itself. Like in a, um, in like an open world RPG, like say Pillars of Eternity or Divinity Original Sin or something like that, um, where you are trying to shape the world in, in some like dramatic fashion, having the option to um, say, save or spare or kill like an NPC at the end of a quest um, is like a valid means of player expression. Um, in something like, uh, and, and in that same context, like what you think of the book that you're reading is not very important. That's just not the, that's not the plane on which the drama is taking place. Um, whereas in Disco, like we're, we're not gonna give you the option to like kill every NPC you meet. Uh, we don't even have a combat system, like, sorry. Um, but whether you liked or disliked or agreed with, um, like, the uh, the ideology espoused by the book that you're reading um, can be quite meaningful because we have a quite developed um, set of political ideologies in the game and those, what you think of the world, like, how you interpret that on an ideological level is a... Um, pretty significant part of like deciding what kind of person your Harry is. Um, and so it, you know, it, it kind of comes down to like, well, what's your game about? That's, that will tell you like where the line is. Yeah. Okay. That's good. That's great. Um, the other question uh, that's, that's live at the moment is how is, how is a game with branching narratives formatted script wise? I guess it's, pertinent to Disco Elysium. How did you mm -hmm. script it? What did you script it in? Uh, so for Disco, we used a, a program called Artisee, which is a, um, a program specifically built to handle um, kind of branching nodes. Um, and we, we did all nearly all of the writing in that. Um, and I there are other tools you can use, like Twine is a free or shareware type program that also allows you to do these uh, sort of structures. Um, yeah, there, there are a couple of tools out there, but they all follow some version of there is a card, there are branches that come off of it, and um, some kind of logic that tells you when to go here versus when to go here, or like when to show this or that option. Um, it's not. Uh, it takes a minute to kind of wrap your head around, but it is, uh, once you get into that mindset, they're like pretty intuitive and cool to use. Yeah. What was it called? The one that you used again? Artisy. Artisy. I've not, not heard of that one, but um, I will check it out. And um, that, that's great. Um, so is there... I mean, I'm I, one, one question I'm interested in is the kind of is the ideology and the politics involved in Disco Elysium um, mm -hmm. and that world. It would, was there a kind of what was the kind of thought process behind that in terms of the writers and the the kind of the the the, the, the how you set it out to, to kind mm -hmm. of start that story? Um, well, I think we. I mean, we wanted to make a world that like felt recognizable and relevant to us. You know, the um, a lot of uh, games of all genres, like when they engage with politics, it's usually in a pretty uh, kind of like superficial or like 
a, I don't know, I want to say like a totemic way or something like that. Like the ideology like represents like something usually good or evil or like interchangeable with some other ideologies. Um, and, you know, we wanted, it was very important to us that the game have a perspective on the world and on events. And so even though, um, you know, you can, there are four ideologies in, in Disco that you can align yourself with, it's like pretty clear where our sympathies as the game developers lie. And that um, it, from a certain school of game design, you, you might say that's a problem. Like it's, the game shouldn't kind of, tip its hand at like what the player should think or should feel or whatever. It should validate all of these player expressions equally. Um, but we we don't believe that. <laughs> like it's um, it's more interesting from a player's point of view to even be able to kind of play against the narrators and say like, ah, oh, will you like leftist video game designers, like I'm going to be like the hardcore libertarian and say like, this is what, <laughs> like this is what the game is about. And that, that kind of creates a interesting narrative or like character logical situations where um, you know you're either aligned with the voice of the game itself or like kind of working against it, um, and I think that's like one of the reasons that um, people have kind of uh, cottoned on to that part of the game. It's really, I mean, it's fascinating to me because so much as you as you say it's totemic or it's kind of good versus bad us versus them so much in video games and and even if there was a tip of the hat i think again it's so complex and detailed that you it's to be explored and to be kind of reasoned and and mm -hmm. it's not just like oh this is what it is it's it, it, there's far more there's far more going on in that story than than you know mm -hmm. than can be simplified or, or reduced down i think yeah that's a really good point actually like another another thing that i think is important is that um these ideologies like ideologies in our real world are like messy and incoherent and sometimes like contradictory um it's not like you know a, a thing that that always kind of feels false in video games is like when there is a a political faction or a religion or an ideology that is like perfectly internally coherent. And it just like tells you, well, some writer or some designer just like made this up because they thought it was like a cool concept. Um, but it doesn't have that feeling of something that has like been built up by many different people over many years that like all real world ideologies have. And so, you know, even though we have four, they're all kind of buckets of related and sometimes competing belief systems and um, that it's like great as writers because it allows us to like be quite messy and human with how we depict those um and uh it, you know it also just like creates a more vivid and you know realistic seeming world despite the fact that it's a an imaginary setting full yeah. of made up people and stuff yeah. Cool. Uh, okay, there's a there's a bunch more questions coming in. Um, there's four here, so let's let's start at the top. To what extent did the writing team consider behavioral and neuroscience insights to develop the protagonist, particularly his traits, intellect, psyche, physique, etc.? Hmm. I mean, I think we uh, on the writing and, and design team, like there. Are a few of us have kind of uh, uh, what I would call like dilettante interests in psychology and, and neuroscience. Um, and so like there are, you know, bits that we draw from like the parts of Harry's brain or like ancient reptilian brain and limbic system. Those are like inspired by, you know, um, actual like kind of uh, neurological structures. Uh, but we're not, again, it's not a, uh, a simulation. We're not trying to accurately in a like kind of one-to-one -one way um, replicate the uh, yeah you know, the actual like neurological structures uh, of the human brain in keeping with like modern neuroscience. Um, we are trying to represent subjectively what it feels like to be a human being with a consciousness, um, especially one that can be like 
talkative and fragmented the way that that Harry's is. Um, so I would say like with all, you know, as in all art, it's a, a source of inspiration, but not a like user manual or like how to guide. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is, can you talk about the evolution of the Revachol setting from its origin as a tabletop campaign to its current shape? Yeah, a little bit. I, um, so I was not there for, uh, for most of this history because the, um, uh, the setting, uh, was like developed by, um, some members of the, the writing team, like the core team was mostly originally Estonian. Um, and they, a kind of group of friends started developing this, um, heavily modified Dungeons and Dragons campaign, um, in their, uh, mid-teens, basically. This was like how, how our friends, uh, wasted time after school or outside school or, or whatever. Um, and it, it started out as a, um, kind of like in a more typical fantasy setting and then kind of what they uh what they did is they realized ah this fantasy setting is kind of lame we should bring it closer to the present and um you know they kind of kept doing that until they got to a a relatively modern um a modern world but then the kind of stroke of genius to it i think is that rather than erasing all of those earlier iterations they they just said like okay well that's going to be the history the actual like world will have progressed through these historical stages that they um, walked through in trying to find a setting that they thought was fun to play in. Okay, cool. Um, what's the next question? The next question is, I'm wondering what sort of narrative design limitations or concessions were made in Disco Elysium based on the fact that audio is limited and then how that changed with the final cut version of it. Mm, so I think what that question is asking, like, how did we write assuming that we were never going to have VO for this, all of these words? Um, and I, uh, I mean, in a way it was, a, I don't recall ever thinking uh, too much about VO while working on the original game, except that there are some like, little kind of uh, stylistic quirks that that are necessary for the parts that that were VO'd in the original game. It's like, for example, when you um, uh, click on a dialogue option and the the other character starts to respond, if that line is VO'd, you like, can't have any narrated text before the um, the the actual quoted speech appears. Like. Um, a, a thing that we wanted to do all the time was say uh, something like so and so shifts uncomfortably and then they start talking, but like it doesn't work for the player's brain if they hear somebody start to say something but then they see the words so and so shifts uncomfortably in their chair, and so uh, that that was like a kind of little stylistic thing that we we had to kind of learn through um, fucking it up many times. Um, but I, I think assuming that we were never going to be able to VO all this text also kind of encouraged us to um, kind of go wild with the amounts of text and the kinds of things that we did there. Um, I mean, I didn't so. see the early version where less was VO'd. So to, by the time I, when I, the final cut to me was like, I mean, it, it's not straightforwardly an interactive radio play, but it kind of reminded mm -hmm. me of uh, an interactive mm -hmm. radio play, but obviously with these kind of amazing kind of yeah. scenarios that, that people were moving around in as well, the visual scenarios. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, um, we're, we're getting kind of short of time, um, and I, but I feel like we should address the, these questions as well. I, I, I'm really keen to also ask you what what you you guys are working on next. If you're at liberty to to tell us, or maybe you're uh, not. But... That'll be very short because I can't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got that out of the way then. Fair enough. Okay, um, some more questions from the audience, um, and as it's the modern audience conference, I will I will focus on these. Which elements do you think make Disco Elysium so thought provoking for the players? I mean, we talked about a few, but are there any that that you really think hit home? 
I mean, I think it's that that interiority, like you've um, like you pointed to before, and that we've talked about a little bit, like the fact that it's a, a game that where some of the most urgent questions that it has you ask are like, what do you really feel about this thing? Um, you know, not just like what are you going to do, but how do you feel? What do you think? Um, those are are like central human questions that um, a game like this is sort of a, like a, a branching narrative game is uh, kind of like uniquely well suited to to ask and explore. Um, and uh, you know, but there there are very few games that kind of take that as their their like remit. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Um, what are the most effective ways to hint that there is a greater world outside the limits of the game? Mm, so that is like a question about world building. Um, and I think some of us have on the writing team, we have different approaches to this. Um, I, I always kind of like being uh elusive in my <laughs> in my writing and just kind of saying like you know oh by the way like there are these other things out here i'm not going to tell you that much about them like but just to know that they're there put this like little bit of language in your brain and have it kick around um and i i think there is a, a kind of art and even a poetry to like it, it's essentially coming up with like lore and jargon um, that imply that there's more to the world than you actually see and interact with, but that that language has to be interesting or poetic enough that it isn't just an annoying thing that the player trips over periodically. Um, but I think also like it just comes down to the way the characters are written. If um, the characters are rich and thoughtfully designed and seem to have a life to themselves outside of whatever dialogue you're currently having with them, uh, then the world automatically feels bigger, you know? And, and that was like a very important thing for us that the shopkeeper, Roy, not just feel like a shopkeeper. He's like someone who has a backstory, has a life um, that, that you can learn about. And I think just realizing that the NPCs that you talk to are not, they, they serve a gameplay function, but they're not just instrumental. They are meant to be vivid characters with interesting things to tell you. Um, that automatically creates a sense that what you're exploring is a, um, a fully developed like social world. Excellent. OK, um, well, as we're sort of on the, the downhill slope, the with looking out the back door or whatever um i just wanted to ask you what other games you like other video games or or any other games uh that you like or you find influential historically or recently just just mm -hmm. you know as an interesting point mm -hmm. i mean the um the other kind of like recent oh, or not necessarily recent kind of narratively driven games that we think about and talk about a lot are um Planescape Torment, which is an older title, but that was like a huge influence for us in, in thinking about um, a character whose like interior life and past are um, are like a thing that's being explored as much as whatever the driving plot seems to be about. Um, I also love the game Kentucky Route Zero. Um, that's uh, just like it, it's very different from Disco, but also like absolutely gorgeously written and beautifully told and a kind of you know more like say like a poetic or philosophically driven game um yeah i i like also personally play a lot of board games um those are kind of they're very very different from what we do because in a board game like the the beauty of it is in like how kind of elegant the system is um, like you don't, a good board game doesn't need that many words to explain how it works. Uh, whereas we have all words and like very few and very rudimentary systems. Um, but I think they, like a, a good game, a good board game can also be a role-playing exercise if the, the systems encourage you to think 
from a, a certain very specific vantage point. Excellent. Great. Well, we're, we're out of time, I'm sorry to say. Um, I could certainly continue for much longer, but um, thank you so much for coming along and sharing your thoughts and ideas and, and the kind of background to the game, which, which everybody, I think, who's interested in interactive storytelling should play Disco Elysium because it's uh, it's so deep, <laughs> it's so complex, and there's nothing yeah, really like it. So um, it's one of my recommendations for sure. So thank you, Justin. Really, really appreciate it. And great to speak with you. And I uh, hope we can do it again sometime. And um, yeah, we'll yeah. see you again. Cool. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you.